session for this meeting has begun. Hello everyone, we're just about to get started and I just wanted to do a quick audio check and see if a few people could let me know that you can hear my voice coming through clearly. And thanks to everyone who's been introducing yourselves. It's really wonderful to see people joining from all over the United States and all over the world. It's really exciting. All right, a few people say I am loud and clear and that you can hear me well. That is what I like to hear. Excellent. All right, we are just a couple minutes after the half hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get things rolling. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. And welcome to our AgriLinks webinar on Sustainable Food Systems, How Better Natural Resources Management Leads to Better Food Security. We're really excited today to have several examples from the field on sustainable food system approaches and to engage all of you in a conversation on these topics. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to kind of introduce you to the webinar and, and um, get some things rolling. Uh, first of all, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist at the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I am the Activity Manager for the AgriLinks platform. And for any of you who are joining us for the first time, AgriLinks is the main uh, technical knowledge sharing website or platform for the Feed the Future initiative, and it's a really great place. Um, for Feed the Future implementing partners and anyone in the agricultural development community to share your work and to learn what others are doing. And as part of AgriLinks, we hold typically monthly webinars, and so this is our webinar for the month of January. Um, let's see, so you'll see on the left side of your screen, we've got uh, a few boxes I want to call your attention to. First of all, you are welcome to download today's uh, slide deck in the file downloads pod. We also have a link to the AgriLinks event page for this webinar, and that is where all of the post-event resources will be going. Uh, but by virtue of joining the webinar today, you will also get an email in uh, a week or two's time with a whole bunch of uh, uh, post-event resources such as the recording, the transcript, and a few other recommended items. Uh, on the right side of your screen, you will see the chat box, and thanks to everyone who's been introducing yourselves and making use of that already. The chat box is your main way to ask questions today, so please don't hesitate at any point during the presentations. Uh, please go ahead and put in your questions. We'll be pausing after each of the speakers to answer a few questions, and then we'll collect more to answer at the end. So yeah, keep using the chat box just like you're doing. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to call your attention on the left to the webinar agenda. Just to keep us on track, you can see um, we've got the main agenda laid out. Uh, right now is the welcome from myself and Emily Weeks, who I'll introduce in just a few moments. You can scroll down in that box to see that next up will be Sarah Scher from Eco Agriculture Partners, um, then Pete Pearson from World Wildlife Fund, and Faisal Hossein from the University of Washington. So we're excited to have these three speakers with us today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Emily Weeks, who will be giving a broader introduction to the topic and to the other three of our speakers. Emily is a senior policy advisor with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and she advises on natural resources management, water, land, and resilience for the Bureau, and has been leading on our Sustainable Food Systems Month for AgriLinks. She is the activity manager for policy research and capacity building across Asia and Africa, for responsible land-based investments in Malawi, and for integrated transboundary water management in Southern Africa. So Emily, I'll pass the mic over to you. Oh. Emily, I can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Yes, you sound great. Great, thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. This topic has increasingly become a topic of um, heavy um, debate and discussion and it seemed appropriate to um, kick off the new year with um, a discussion around sustainable food systems. Um, I wanted to give a bit of a background around uh, why um, the Bureau for Food Security chose this topic um, based on some of our goals and objectives um, outlined in our Feed, Feed the Future initiative. 
So our Feed the Future initi initiative aims to help and solve problems of ending global hunger, hunger and creating sustainable long-term change um, in, our food, in our approach to food production. And through our global food security strategy, which guides our current programming, one of the main objectives is to increase sustainable agricultural production. This includes improved efficiencies and sustainability throughout the entire food system, and also designing interventions that um, adopt a systems-wide approach, uh, include, inclusive of assessments of environmental conditions. As we are all aware, there is continued pressures placed on our natural resources due to increasing population and ever-growing demand for food, and along with this, changing dietary patterns and consumption patterns, which is leading to changes um, in land use um, change and also increasing uh, pressures on our natural assets through this land use change. To add to this, we have climate change that brings added, um, added challenges to meeting our food security goals and also to uh, our long-term goal of sustainable food production. Our most vulnerable uh, communities, including smallholder farmers, pastoralists, and fishing communities, are affected by these impacts. And so we now are at a stage where we need to respond to these challenges by looking at transforming our existing agricultural practices and reducing our pressures on natural systems and the services they provide. So to address this challenge, um, today we have the privilege of engaging with some of the top experts who are indeed working towards meeting, uh, finding a solution. And uh, by bringing together these speakers, we have the unique opportunity to discuss this across the entire food system. We'll begin our session with addressing how to transform our approach to agricultural production, looking at the entire landscape and then move to the other end of the food system by addressing the importance of reducing food waste. And lastly, provide examples of how innovative approaches can um, implement technologies to improve our resource management. So we look forward to and encourage questions and discussions around this topic. And again, thank you for joining us. And a big thank you to our speakers for taking time to be here with us today. Thank you. I'll pass it on to oh. Julie. Oh. Thank you so much, Emily. And um, I will just quickly introduce our three speakers, and then we can get rolling with the content. Uh, so first up will be Sarah Scher with Equo Agriculture Partners. And she is an agricultural and resource economist and a prominent voice globally in promoting restoration of degraded lands. And uh, she'll be speaking first. And next up will be Pete Pearson with World Wildlife Fund who is the Senior Director of Food Loss and Waste at WWF, uh, helping businesses and communities understand agriculture's impact on wildlife and habitat conservation. And last but not least, we will have Faisal Hossein from the University of Washington. Um, and um, he'll be uh, covering smart technology solutions to feed Asia. So I'll pass it off to Sarah Sher first. Uh, thank you very much. So this is Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and I'd like to thank AgriLinks for the invitation. And I think this um, whole webinar reflects a growing consensus that food security depends on sustainable management of the natural resource base, and at the same time, sustaining biodiversity and ecosystem services depends on how we manage our agriculture and our food systems. And if we take this seriously, we need to think about action beyond the farm and community scale and even beyond our supply chains to look at how we're going to co-manage our agriculture, food systems, and ecosystems. Uh, the organization I work for, Eco Agriculture Partners, is an international NGO that's been working since 2002 uh, to see how we can transform a landscape. So I'm going to try to take you through that a bit today. Um, to start with, I think it's really important to recognize this issue that the entire sustainable development goals are actually contributing to food security. 
We're talking today particularly about zero hunger, about land and water resources, about sustainable production and consumption and, and climate. But the other components are really key. We're talking about a global shift to inclusive green economy in which the natural resource assets are supporting this as well as being supported by it. Um, we, we need to achieve the SDGs in every place. Um, every landscape, and I'm using that term landscape here to mean a socio-ecological system of natural and human modified ecosystems with their own unique characteristics. And these landscapes may range from tens of thousands of hectares to, to millions of hectares, depending upon the context and the people in them. Yet despite this interconnectedness, we live in a world where most of our institutions are being managed in different sectoral silos. I, I like this little picture that shows a landscape in which part of the landscape is, is led by the water ministry and another part by agriculture. And so these ecosystem connections and social and economic connections are not very well, um, really not very well addressed in this uh, system. We need a new approach, and this approach is emerging around the world. We are calling it, as an umbrella term, integrated landscape management which means long-term collaboration among the different groups of land managers and stakeholders to achieve all the goods and services that they need from the landscape. In other words, to meet all of the sustainable development goals, not just to 2030, but, but for the future uh, across generations. Indeed, this approach is being used in many parts of the world. I'm going to briefly uh, suggest to you a couple of the, uh, or give you a couple of illustrations um, in the uh, north coast of Honduras, a very humid uh, agroecosystem, uh, which is the most important agricultural export area of the country, um, also one of its most important areas of both terrestrial and coastal biodiversity. And you're seeing a huge growth in population, as well as a huge growth, growth in export agriculture. Um, a, a number of years ago, under the convening of an international NGO, uh, the oil palm producers, the cocoa producers, the biodiversity managers, the water managers, the municipalities, the tourist actors all got together on a single platform to develop a vision for the future of this, this area that would transform it from a trajectory of quite serious uh, resource degradation and impoverishment for many of the people living there to one that would be a sustainable uh, development strategy. In a very different place, in the barren tract of Bangladesh, uh, this is an area that is where is very dependent on irrigated rice and is facing huge challenges for climate change adaptation um, as well as loss of biodiversity. And uh, local organizations and government agencies have come together to try to develop a water-centric type of landscape management strategy across this whole large region that will try to align the efforts from different sectors uh, to move towards a, a, a vision of, of climate adaptation. Um, an, an, another uh, very, again, a very different kind of a context is in the drylands of northern Kenya in the county of Laikipia, which is like a, like a province. Um, and in this area, led by county governments, there's an effort to address food security of vulnerable groups um, by looking not only at the kinds of food assistance programs that, which were originally there, but to look at the driving factors of vulnerability, uh, uh, food insecurity, and look at the natural resource base, improving land health, improving markets, and stabilizing the water resources uh, in an integrated way that will address, address this issue. Um, this kind of, an, of, of partnerships are arising not only in these three places, but eco-agriculture partners, together with a number of our other uh, research partners, have done did a series of studies between 2013 and 2015 documenting these integrated landscape initiatives that had an established platform that were working on agriculture and environment and livelihoods and development at the same time. And at that time, we documented 428 of these large landscape initiatives. The numbers now are, are, are actually much higher. And one of the interesting things is many people think about landscape initiatives as, as having a very strong environmental focus, which they, they typically do. But you can see that if you look at the priority objectives 
and impacts of these landscape initiatives, a very high proportion of these uh, nearly half have as major objectives and achievements significant increases in agricultural yields and improved profitability of farming. Uh, if you go down to the livelihoods impacts that many of them report, you have in South and Southeast Asia 70% reporting that these landscape partnerships have successfully improved food security in the work that they're doing. The, there are actually many different communities of practice that are working in, 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 this, um, in these fields. I've counted more than 97 different uh, words that are used for integrated landscape management. But all of these have five key features that show that they are working towards integrated landscape management. The, the first of these is um, collaborative community-engaged processes so that you can have dialogue among stakeholders, negotiation, common visioning, planning, and, and action. And these are usually voluntary. They may be convened by a variety of different kinds of agencies, but they are characterized by being voluntary and, and inclusive. A second uh, major feature of these kinds of initiatives is that the groups do negotiate shared or agreed landscape objectives. And these are generational objectives, not just short-term objectives, that the groups will commit to taking actions that are aligned with, with this vision. The, the third uh, feature of these landscape initiatives are the commitment to align field practices, agricultural practices, forest practices, in ways that benefit multiple landscape objectives. Um, and farmers you know, see that they're playing a critical role in watershed management, that they play a critical role in biological uh, bi corridors. By the same token, environmental agencies and NGOs recognizes that the actions they're taking for biodiversity conservation need to provide food security and to support the farming actors that are in their, in, in their communities. The um, fourth area is that land uses across the landscape are managed to achieve synergies and to reduce conflicts. This may be upstream-downstream relationships in watersheds. It may be devising new market relationships between part of the landscape so that biodiversity-friendly products can benefit um, conservation of forests, uh, et cetera. And then the final piece that characterizes these landscape uh, part, effective landscape uh, partnerships and initiatives are that instead of being siloed, market development considers the impacts across the range of landscape objectives, policies are aligned, and mobilization of finances aligned to address the full set of objectives in these landscapes. Now, what is the process that is being used to pull these stakeholders together? This is not an easy process. It's one that requires investment in time and effort. Um, but they pretty much experience around the world is now suggesting uh, the ways in which uh, most of these initiatives develop. Uh, the most important piece is the multi-stakeholder platform. Sometimes that's formal, sometimes it's informal. But those are the groups that drive the process. We're looking at perhaps, a con not perhaps, we're definitely looking at trying to achieve national and global goals, but, according, but really looking at the, basing that on the priorities of local people. These are locally driven landscape initiatives, and other actors need to restructure um, the way they're providing support to these local actors and, and, and information within them. Um, they move from that to a process of shared understanding. Everybody's got their own perspective about, a land, about landscapes. Uh, and they may be a little different, and they need to really understand why others uh, have, have this. They need to move to collaborative planning and design, visioning to design, then effective implementation, including financing and monitoring. There are many tools that have been developed to do this. And there's now a new initiative that we hope that some of you may want to join in the future for scaling up these locally-led landscape transformation uh, called 1,000 Landscapes for 1 Billion People. I look forward to talking with you all more about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, a few questions came in during your presentation that I thought I would toss out to you. Uh, first up, Indra Klein asked, 
With one-third of the world's soils degraded due to erosion, do you have any thoughts on cost-effective measures being taken to address this in the implementation of ag development projects? No, that's, that's a big question and I think a central question. It's also one of the questions, I think that the soil issue is one that brings together stakeholders in a way that many others do not. Farmers care about it, climate activists care about it, watershed managers care about it. So I think it's receiving a huge amount of long delayed uh, support for doing work. But I think I've seen a number of extremely exciting um, initiatives to mobilize soil um, restoration. And I think these landscape initiatives bring in stakeholders beyond just the farmers and give them support by doing everything from um, having labeled agricultural products that are determined to be from sustainably managed uh, soils and resources to uh, programs of uh, voluntary carbon emission credits that are being used to fund long-term programs of soil restoration with farmers. Um, I, I think there's, there, there's actually a, a been a huge growth of, of, of efforts to support farmer organizations in the work they're doing around soils by providing both financial and technical support from watershed management organizations. Um, anyway, I, I think there's, this is actually one of the big growth areas in this field, I think. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, a clarifying question came in from Christopher Bowden, who asked, does anyone monitor and check that the commitments are being upheld in the examples that you shared? Yeah. The, when I was going through that, that little process, and I, I very quickly went over the, the piece on monitoring evaluation, this is an outgrowth of something that many of you may be familiar with in collaborative adaptive management, which, which came out of more of a community level. Um, of natural resource management. And the monitoring piece is actually critical. And these, the landscape initiatives that are successful are the ones that at least every year pull the group together to assess where they are against the objectives that they had defined. Sometimes this is done in a qualitative way. There's a wide range of new monitoring methods that are making really reducing the cost of this kind of monitoring. And some of these initiatives are now moving toward more comprehensive landscape impact assessments that they can, again, use not, not to, to punish those who don't, who don't do necessarily what they're doing, but to make it very transparent and to have a learning process and to sustain the, the effect of collaboration where people actually have trust. Uh, there's new tools such as LandScale, which are being developed now for impact assessment at the landscape scale. But I think the most important thing is that people review the commitments they've made every year and determine, you know, if they're having problems reaching their commitments, they have a discussion about whether maybe other stakeholders can do things that make it easier for them to achieve their commitments. Very, a very central piece of these kinds of initiatives. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll do two more questions before we move on to the next speaker. Um, let's see, one came in from Sarah Carlson, who says, how does the integrated landscape framework deal with the very real trade-offs that exist when accommodating different sector goals? For example, some species cannot toler tolerate disturbance, such as specialist species with narrow habitat requirements, and it may not be feasible for communities to adopt environmentally friendly behaviors in the short term. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sarah, Sarah, your question is central to the whole rationale for integrated landscape management. We have decades of an e efforts to try to make the same things happen in the same landscape through very different decision making and implementation processes. And the, 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 the point that I was making earlier about that process of doing um, under, shared understanding of the landscape is often central. Most agricultural development agencies actually don't understand this issue of, for example, very sensitive habitats for, for particular landscapes. And there are things that you can develop as solutions at a landscape scale that are not possible to do at a community or a, or a local farm, farm level. And this is about doing collaborative planning and actually um, if there are losses that need to be incurred by certain actors within the landscape. Uh, what you're finding in these initiatives is very creative ways of compensating them for that, 
uh, providing additional, say, land resources away from um, the, the very sensitive areas that they are going to be allowed to use, that other landholders will allow them to use. So I, I think that what this does is make very explicit the trade-off and provides a very concrete process for negotiating the outcome, not at not the expense of an individual farmer, but looking at this as a collaborative uh, a, a commitment. Great, thank you. I'll ask you one more question, and then we can hold some more for the end of the presentation. Uh, let's see. So, kind of a compact but um, you know somewhat challenging question from Emily Harata. What are the disadvantages and challenges to the integrated landscape management approach? Um, I, 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 often t I often start talks that I give by saying that if you don't need to do an integrated landscape approach, you shouldn't do it. If there are not really serious potential conflicts and complementarities between what different people in the landscape are doing, you know, it's not worth doing the institutional investment that's required for integrated landscape management. So I, I think the, the, the question here is more if you do have a situation where you're trying to build a biological corridor through an agricultural production area, I'm not sure that there is actually an alternative to doing integrated landscape management. And, the, and re, you know, basically not just, not just relying upon only government agencies to pro solve this problem or only relying upon certification, pro private certification programs to do this or only relying on local NGOs to make these things happen, but actually find some way that these groups can, uh, can align and explicitly deal with their conflicts and their concerns in a controlled and, 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 uh, and, and a, an environment and under a convening process that in which people have some trust. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to all of our participants for uh, putting your excellent questions in the chat box. We are collecting them all, and uh, we'll continue to ask a few more after the other two speakers. And of course, I encourage all of you, uh, if you have answers to each other's questions um, or suggested resources, please do post those in the chat box. Um, all thank right, you very now, much. Oh, great, thank you. And for now, we'll move on to Pete Pearson with World Wildlife Fund. Thank you so much. Am I coming through okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's a real privilege to be able to speak with everyone today and excited to present uh, some work that we're doing. So again, I am the Senior Director of our Food Loss and Waste Strategy for the uh, I International Network. And just a quick recap for what World Wildlife Fund does. So I think most would be familiar with our brand and, and, and what our mission is, but we're a science-based organization we work a lot with companies and communities. And the big thing is we strive to meet the needs of both people and nature. Um, we see these two things connected and, and we have to do both. In terms of our reach, we're one of the largest uh, conservation organizations in the world. We have presence in over 100 com countries, uh, about 80 offices plus globally. Um, and then we also have built a, a huge amount of momentum with people all around the world. About 6,000 people are members of World Wildlife Fund, a little, or 6 million, sorry, a little over a million just in the US alone. So a little bit of context for who we are. When you look at what we do, um, you can imagine it's, it's what you would expect, right? We work in areas like forests, oceans, wildlife poaching and crime, climate, freshwater. But the one that most people don't know about is the, the work that we do within food systems. And we focus in on three fundamental areas. We focus in on sustainable production. So really looking at uh, zero conversion landscapes, certification programs. Um, we work on eliminating loss and waste, which is the program that I lead. And then there's this whole area of sustainable consumption, which could probably fill another webinar by itself when we really look at sustainable diets and sustainable consumption. But the reason why, so since about 1970, um, about a 60% decrease in populations of mammals, birds, amphibian, fish, and other vertebrates. And when we look at the reasons why we see these biodiversity losses, one of the biggest culprits is food and agriculture, right? And it makes a lot of sense when you connect this. It, it's when you lose 70% of the, 
it's estimated because of food production. It's because we're expanding agriculture's footprint, right? We continue to use habitat and convert habitat, and that's what wildlife and biodiversity needs. Now, when we look at the impacts of food, it's not just land conversion, but we have greenhouse gas emissions, high chemical usage, the use of fresh water. It's the largest user of fresh water on the planet. And then we have this issue of the loss of topsoil. All these things factor into why World Wildlife Fund is really focused on the issue of food and food systems. So what I thought would be good is, is the exercise that we have in front of us, the way we view this, is there are sustainable development goals that are very interconnected and linked. Um, if we're out to meet the needs of both people and nature, we have to address sustainable development goal two, which is ending hunger. Now, the, the, real, the, the real challenge is to do this in a way that also doesn't reduce biodiversity on the planet any further than it's been reduced. And so those are uh, SDG goals 15 and 14. How do we meet the needs of reducing and eliminating hunger while also maintaining biodiversity? I would contend, we would contend that one of the imperatives for doing this is making sure that you are addressing SDG 12, which is responsible consumption and production, and more, more specifically SDG 12.3, which is reducing food loss and food waste. Now these, these critical elements all come together and we try to do this by freezing the footprint of food, right? We want to ensure that that encroachment on biodiversity and habitat loss and a zero landscape conversion is achieved and we can really only do that by addressing uh, food loss and waste. Um, I'll talk briefly about our overall global strategy on food loss and waste. It, it covers many different segments, these five. So, you know, we look at the hospitality industry. We're working with restaurants and food service. We work with grocery retailers globally. We're working on farms. And we also just launched a, a really great program that looks at schools and universities in the United States, and we're expanding that globally, hopefully. But what I'll do today is I'll talk primarily about the work on farms and the work within the hospitality industry. So one of the things that we did about two years ago is we wanted to start collecting more primary data for what type of loss we see on farms. And you know, quite literally what we did is we started going out into fields and measuring loss that we saw in fields. Um, we did this on five or so different types of products, and we started a series that we're calling No Food Left Behind. So one of the things that we were analyzing, not only just the quantification of how much loss we see for certain crops, but we also wanted to understand why this was happening. And our focus in this report and series right now is on the United States. And what you start uncovering is there is huge opportunities to make sure that we can rescue and make more food available from our harvests. Um, but we have to address the market considerations for why this food isn't being uh, taken out of fields, harvested, transported, right? This is a market issue. And the No Food Left Behind series really tried to address how we can start to develop solutions to do that. I think this is really pertinent for any type of development strategy because what you want to do is develop, have development that addresses food loss and waste up front and make sure that one of the primary goals of development is to fully utilize everything you're growing and ensure that no loss and waste is happening in the system. In a, in a country like America, in the U.S., it's difficult because a lot of these systems are already entrenched, and so you're having to work backwards to retrofit or to change the way you do things. I have high hopes in places that are developing, you can actually start to design the food loss and waste out of the system up front so that you never even realize it in the future. Um, the other thing we're doing is we go to the opposite side of the supply chain towards the consumption end. And we've been working with um, hospitality and tourism quite a bit. Um, in 2017, World Wildlife Fund launched a platform called Hotel Kitchen. 
And this is working with some of the, the largest hotel chains in the world on trying to reduce the impacts of consumption and loss later in the supply chain. Um, we take a very prevention first approach to this. So the entire goal is to not even create food waste to begin with. It's not to create a compost pile. Um, we do not grow food to compost it or to uh, you know, deal with it in an anaerobic digester. What we want to do is maximize the utility of that food and make sure it gets to people. Again, this is that linkage to SDG2. We want to make sure that globally the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels are taking seriously their commitment to donate food when they can to local communities and make sure that uh, local communities see that food and people, that it gets to people. Obviously, too, we want to make sure diversion is moving away from landfills. We do not want to see food waste in landfills as it adds uh, another environmental burden of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's just a poor use of a, of a great resource that can be turned actually back into food, either as animal feed or as nutrients and compost for the soils. So where I think this all comes together is in one particular area. <clears throat> um, we are now working both with post-harvest loss research and also working with the hospitality community in an area called Kaza in sub-Saharan Africa. Kaza is an amazing place. It has five countries bordering this region which represents a huge wealth of biodiversity. Um, some of the last remaining really so, uh, solid spots for biodiversity left in Africa and we want to protect that. And we feel we can do that by really addressing how the food system is designed and where it needs to be 10, 20, and 30 years from now. Um, so this work we've been doing is analyzing both loss on the farm side, but then also making sure that when we look at consumption within hospitality, grocery chains, and even in homes, that we're able to design food loss and waste out of the system and fully utilize everything in the supply chain. So I'm really excited about this work in CASA. Um, it really represents uh, a culmination of how we want to use all the tools we've been developing to see what type of future we can bring to a place like that. And uh, it's, it's ultimately trying to answer this, this important question. How do we meet the needs of a growing planet, both in terms of population and affluency? And how do we ensure that we don't completely uh, lose all the biodiversity and the ecosystem services in the process, which in all honesty, we know we need that biodiversity in order to be prosperous on the agricultural side. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, happy to take questions and to explore this with the group. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Pete. A few questions have come in during your presentation that I'll throw out to you. Uh, first one from Christopher Bowden. How did WWF choose the five or so crops to address farm-based waste, in your example? Yeah, great question. Well, we wanted a diversity. So we chose uh, leafy greens. We chose potatoes, tomatoes, peaches. And the reason why we did that is each one represents a really different type of both harvest and a process for planting and growing. So you know, one's a root crop, one's a leafy green, one's a pit fruit. And what you start to see are some patterns around uh, how that whole harvest and distribution can change and be different. And so, you know, it, it gets a little difficult. There's, you know, 200 or so different types of fresh fruit and vegetable commodities, so we can't do them all. So we tried to be smart about what types we picked by just um, the way that they're characterized in harvest and in growing cycles. And, and, Great, and thank really, you. really quick, I saw on the message question. board why, oh, why is, oh, sure. I know cereals okay. were chosen. Uh, that's actually something we're doing right now. So we're, we're taking on the idea of uh, uh, corn or maize, um, soy, and some other larger commodity crops, which typically are going into more feed systems, but that is something we're looking at as well.
All right, another question from Emily Hirata. How has the nutrition community been involved in the dialogue with freezing the footprint of food? For instance, if plant-based diets are less harmful to the planet and may slow those footprints, how is the nutrition community or industry involved with those efforts? <clears throat> um, I think it's really important. Uh, it's, we're obviously an environmental organization, so nutrition is not our specialty. Um, but we are continuously running into, I think, opportunities to partner with nutrition organizations and to explore this linkage between nutrition and environmental trade-offs. Um, it's not always as black and white as you would expect. Um, you know, some, sometimes even plant-based uh, diets and, and items have environmental impact as well. Um, one that I would point to right away would be the avocado, right? I mean, we know that the avocado is a, is a great alternative for plant-based diets and something that's gaining huge popularity. Um, but it does have environmental trade-offs and, and there is, you know, there's butterfly habitat that can potentially be impacted in places like Mexico and Latin America. And so I think we have to be really, really aware that there is no black and white answer to all these questions. And, and I really liked what Sarah was talking about when she says collaborative engagement for development, you know, and, and having these collaborative approaches to shared landscape objectives. I think that is extremely important. And, and my contention is let's make sure to build food loss and waste into every single one of those collaborative engagements. I think it's that critical. Uh, let's see. I think I'll ask you one more question, and then we can come back to a few more at the end. Um, an interesting question from Gu Long Liang. Is there a specific example or just kind of a theoretical example that you can share about how to reversely design farming systems with the goal to reduce food loss. Have you seen that in an international development context, kind of sort of doing a, a reverse design as a way to reduce food waste? Yeah, I think uh, in, in every single instance, there's one thing that rises to the top of importance, and it's making sure you build measurement and monitoring of food loss into the system up front. So maybe one example of seeing this as a reversed strategy um, is to make sure that as, like in a place like Casa, as you have five or six hotel chains that are exploding, more tourists are coming, the community is getting bigger, as they're purveying more food, having your buyers working with the farmers to make sure that loss is measured, understood, so that you can develop longer term contracts and a more shared responsibility across the whole supply chain, I think is critically important. Um, for the most part, loss is not a function of farmers doing poorly. It's a market function. And I think the more we can connect buyers to those farmers and create an ecosystem of shared values, that's that reverse engineering that we wanna see where we're trying to build loss and waste out of the system by having a shared value approach, that collaborative engagement. But measurement is critical to all of that. We have to be measuring this constantly and everywhere. Um, agreed, thank you so much. Uh, all right, in the interest of time, we will move on to our third speaker and then come back with a few more questions at the end. Uh, so I'd like to pass the mic over to Faisal Hossein from University of Washington. Take it away. All right. Hello, hello, everyone. I want to thank USAID AgriLinks for organizing this excellent webinar. So today I want to talk for the next few minutes on how we could grow more food with less, in this case, less water, and use some technology solutions as they would apply to Asia. So let's quickly look into... Um, the, um, the water use productivity that we have in some of the more popular, populous countries of Asia that have similar climate but grow also the similar type of food. And what you notice from this slide is that China is doing pretty well for every unit volume of water and growing the major crops. India is a distant second and Pakistan is quite at the bottom, which is the same story you see on the right of the map. You know, that color red indicates the amount of irrigated water you're using to grow the same kilocalories of food. 
So given this wide range of variability and the fact that you can actually get more uh, from the water use in a similar climate, the question that we can ask ourselves is, can we grow more with less, less water? So I want to share some experience we've had uh, starting with Pakistan, then we'll go further east to India and then Bangladesh. So, you know, in Pakistan, you have the Indus River system, you have the world's largest irrigation system. And what you see in this slide is five rivers joining in the middle to become Indus River. The colored region is the command area of the irrigation system where the water is brought to farmers through a series of crisscrossing canals. Each color represents a cropping pattern. So where you see purple, it means that you will only be growing cotton alternated with uh, wheat. Um, it's a very centrally planned system where you would see vast tracts of the same crop being grown. In other words, you have very little uh, heterogeneity in the crops. However, if you look into the history of such a uh, irrigation system, you know it was designed almost 100 years ago for just one crop a year for which the surface water was sufficient and food demand wasn't so high. But the reality today is it's been used two to three times more its design limit for which obviously you don't have enough surface water. So what the farmers are essentially doing is they're pumping the additional water that they think is needed for irrigation from the ground at very unsustainable rates. Um, I, um, I can interrupt. We've just had one request for you to speak up just a little bit. OK, thank you. So I I'll, I'll, uh, hope I'm louder this time. So for example, um, let's talk about rice. Um, you know, rice in any irrigated irrigation system will comprise the lion's share of your uh, irrigation water requirement. In the case of Pakistan, it's the same. If you pick a province like Punjab that's somewhat humid, in one growing season, you would need about 600 millimeters. That would be crop water demand. In a somewhat drier province, it's a little more. But if you see how much farmers are applying, they're applying at least two to three times more on the farm, which obviously means it's a lot of excess, um, which means the groundwater table is going down and costlier pumping each year. But more importantly, I think this is, results in loss of crop productivity because the nutrients in the root zone leach further below, making it unavailable to the crops. So the problem you know, we are trying to solve is how do we change the farmer's mindset that they don't need to irrigate so much? And how can the solution be sustainable and affordable? So the idea we came up with was, you know, we had these low-hanging fruits, these two low-hanging fruits. One is you see in the upper right these Earth-observing satellites, which there's a collection of them out there that take a pulse of the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. And using that, you can, you know, um, predict or observe current and past uh, weather conditions, especially rainfall. But you can also predict current and past uh, crop water demand. You also have these uh, atmospheric models at, at the bottom, the global numerical weather prediction models that can that assimilate satellite data, but they can also uh, predict current and future rainfall as well as they can be used to predict or forecast, uh, you know, future crop water demand as well as current crop water demand. So what we can do essentially is we could do a demand and supply analysis and figure out when the farmers need to irrigate, when they don't. And we could fire those messages to the farmer's phone because almost all farmers either have a flip phone or a smartphone. And you tell them to irrigate when demand is more than supply and vice versa. So here demand is your crop evapotranspiration, supply is the rainfall. So we. Um, implemented uh, such a solution, and it will look something like this here in Pakistan. You see a, a snapshot of the messages in Urdu. This is a translation for you in English. We added a forecast-based advisory later on, and we began this in 2016. And it scaled up pretty nicely from 700 farmers to currently it's serving about 100,000 farmers. And we were also able to do a quantitative impact evaluation. And the results that came uh, out from that is that it's saving about 40% of irrigation water. That's all pumped groundwater that would have otherwise been lost. Just to put a perspective on this number in volumetric terms, that's about 2.5 cubic kilometer, which is you know, a large dam can hold about 10 to 15 cubic kilometer. So what this means is that if you can have the system running for about 10 years or so, you can save about one to two large dam worth of water underground. So you're giving the groundwater system some breathing space to build up its stock. Also, the usage is quite high. And we have anecdotal evidence of farmer income increasing by virtue of the yield also increasing. 
However, if you go further east to India, you know, India, the situation changes a little bit. First of all, you don't have one major national irrigation system in that country. You also have way more farmers, 140 million to be precise. Most of them are marginal, you know, 65%, some say even 80% with a plot size less than one acre. And you have tremendous variability on the cropping pattern, as you can see in these pictures on the left. And any coarse resolution system like the one I showed you before in Pakistan just will not work. So we need something that's finer resolution. So the idea we came up with is to use these, you know, technology of the day, which is IoT or Internet of Things, and this, you know, low-powered wide area network. Basically, it's a low bandwidth Wi-Fi. What you see in this slide is on the left is like an environmental sensor that's very cheap. They run on two AA batteries uh, for a couple of years hardly needing any maintenance, and they would record an environmental parameter. In this case, you see water level. They won't store it, but they will relate to the router that you see in the middle that will be hanging from a tower. And the router won't record it either. It will push it to the cloud, the internet. The router itself is very low power, so it can run on a solar panel. And essentially, you're not having to send any people to go collect data every time, and these sensors are like working 24-7 just for a couple of AA batteries for a couple of years. So this is how our system was born called PANI, Provision for Advisory on Necessary Irrigation. Some of you may know this is the local vernacular for water in South Asia. So essentially it uses the same coarse resolution system and it combines it with these IoT sensors, you know, you see in the upper two plots. And then it tries to provide something uh, much more meaningful at the plot level for the marginal farmer. And um, this is how the advisories would look like on the farmer's phone. You have this weather advisory. You have a little bit of the irrigation advisory. This is, of course, in Hindi. And on the left side, if you see, we also have to customize the message in a way that the farmers understand. So typically, farmers use finger as a unit for irrigation. Also, we ran the numbers. And the cost that came out for Pani is about, in rural India and in the northern region, is about $5 a year capital cost. So we think it's pretty affordable. We piloted the system. And it's still running uh, since 2018, and the results that we got, you know, here you see a sample of the farmers that we interviewed, about 150 or so. And the general summary is that 85% of the people find uh, this system quite useful. But what's interesting is the yield. We tracked the yield, and we found that the wheat yield, I mean, that time they were growing wheat, um, the yield was about four to 5,000 kilograms per hectare. Now, government reported yield that side is quite less, and we believe that this increase in yield is because of the unnecessary irrigation that they avoided, the excessive irrigation, which, of course, lowers the yield. Um, as we speak now, the system has uh, expanded further east to Bangladesh. Um, you can go check this website. Um, uh, here you see a map with uh, the numbers that indicate the number of farmers that are kind of trialing the system right now. It's a public-private partnership. And uh, what makes Bangladesh very interesting is that in addition to being a poster child for climate change, in the coastal region, the naturally occurring water on the ground or underground is brackish, so it cannot be used for farming. So the only time they get fresh water is from the heavens, from the skies during the monsoon season, which uh, means that if these farmers would grow anything during the dry season, they actually would have to harvest the rainwater, and that's what they do. So these farmers actually came to us and told us, hey, we'd be interested in this system, Pani, because we really want to avoid unnecessary excessive irrigation during the winter season because we have preciously harvested the rainwater. So we'll see how that goes. But we do have uh, some impact uh, results that we, we surveyed the farmers. We got some sort of impact assessment. Similar story you see here, close to about 80% of the farmers, mostly marginal, find it useful. There is room for improvement, of course, uh, for the remaining 22% or 20% or so. But I think what's interesting here is that, you know, recently there was this cyclone that happened in end of November called Cyclone Bulbul. And a lot of the farmers told us that the forecast for rain really helped them protect their crops, especially vegetables, because those farmers who are not getting this advisory, they actually had watered their vegetables. And after the cyclone came and we had additional rain, it just washed their crops out. So uh, obviously, during these natural hazard, hazards or calamities, uh, this, this kind of an advisory turns out to be additionally useful. So I want to end with uh, three take-home messages uh, for the audience. The one is, of course, we have these low-hanging fruits, uh, satellites and atmospheric models. 
which are not being used as much as they should be, uh, at least in the developing world, and I think they should be in Asia if you want to grow more with less water. They should be the cornerstone of any technology solutions to make them affordable and sustainable. Second is, of course, if you want to feed Asia, we have to be giving the marginal farmers a voice and give them solutions that they can adapt to. Third is technology that's precise and smart does not have to be expensive. So I'm going to end right there and happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we've had a lot of good questions come in during your presentation, so I'll kind of rapid fire ask you some of them uh, before we come back and ask some additional ones uh, for Pete and Sarah as well. Let's see. So first up, from Christopher Bowden, how reliable are the crop evapotranspiration rates estimated by satellites? Would the resolution be good enough for smallholder farmers? So that's a good question. So, so in the Pakistan case, we didn't need a very high spatial resolution, and we essentially did not use the satellite so much. Uh, we used the numerical weather prediction model outputs, and they were validated compared with the local agency that we've been working with. Uh, you know, it's Pakistan Council for Research and Water Resources. They had a couple of lysimeters. And they came out pretty well, the trends, and you had to do some additional calibration. Now, for high resolution evapotranspiration or crop water demand estimates, for, say, small plots, where weather variability, uh, getting it at the right scale is important, at least to scales of, say, 500 to meters to 100, uh, one kilometer, I think you would have to use these additional sensors, these IoT sensors. If you just rely on the, um, you know, just the satellites or the weather prediction models, which are at scales of 10 to 25 kilometers, it will just not be sufficient. Um, I know what, many of the weather patterns do not change so much, um, like temperature or wind speed. You know, they vary at scales of maybe a kilometer or so, but you would still need to use those. So my answer is uh, probably not. You would still have to use some localized information to downscale it and make it very representative at the plot scale. Uh, great, thank you. Let's see, another question um, came in from both Indra Klein and Polly Galita, who both wanted to know if the uh, notification service is free to farmers, if they're, if they're paying for it. Um, if so, is this sustainable over time? And also some curiosities about whether it's sent via an SMS. Right. So the messages right now are all SMS. They're extremely simple because you may know that, you know, a lot of these smart ag applications, 90% of them fail because I believe we make it unnecessarily complex. So it is SMS-based. And in the Pakistan's case, it's the federal government that's running this system as a service for the farmers. But there are talks with Asian Development Bank and this Telenor Pakistan to commercialize it a little bit, like in a, in a manner that's a little affordable. In India's case, you have seen the business model. It's five dollars a year, that, and they're more than happy to pay that. In the case of Bangladesh, the private sector is already engaged with the public sector right now and figuring out how much they are willing to pay. But we haven't figured out the business model. But yes, the bottom line is eventually such a system or service will have to be sustainable, not just technologically, but also financially. So farmers would uh, be having to pay a very modest amount that they can uh, really afford, and the benefits are, I think, way more than what they pay. Great, thank you. Let's see, a question from Guolong Liang. Apart from satellite estimated ET, what other tools are or do you think should be implemented in the estimation system? Uh, so just a quick correction, the ET is not just using satellite data, it's also using the weather model data. But we could also be using, and we should be using a lot of the satellite imagery on the crop type. You can also predict crop health. You can also predict, um, you know, any kind of um, crop canopy or crop age or growth stage. So those are very useful because depending on the crop type and the growth stage, that dictates the ET. But you can also use a lot of the satellite data or localized information on the soils. In fact, any information on soil wetness helps because that will actually help you tweak or fine-tune the ET estimates that the crops 
have because depending on how much you have in the soil will dictate how much the crops need, additional water that the crops need. So yes, there are a couple of other things that we could be using to fine tune and make this service even more, uh, I would say, uh, accurate and relevant to the farmers. Great, thank you. Um, just a, a general question to pose to you. A couple of our um, participants have asked about whether the tools and lessons that you shared will be, would be applicable in other contexts, such as Central America, or um, have some interest in knowing if they could pilot this project in their country, et cetera. Just what general suggestions do you have for people who are interested in either broadening this work or knowing how it's applicable elsewhere? Right. So my answer is yes, it is, because it's a fairly simple system, and the low-hanging fruits are all globally available, publicly available. Um, the next country we're expanding this to is Nepal, but certainly in South America or South Asia it can be done. Uh, I would uh, probably point to a couple of resources that, uh, um, Julia, I can give to you where there is an extended talk with some literature on how one might be able to go about and implementing it themselves. There will be probably some assistance needed on getting the data, but they're not very difficult. So my answer is yes, it, it can be done, and I would highly encourage that it be implemented because the core of the data that's using is freely available. Great, thank you. Yes, and, and a reminder to all of our participants, we will be sending out an email with the post-event resources, including the recording of this webinar. And so that could be a good time, uh, Faisal, for you to share uh, some additional resources that we can include in that post-event email. Uh, let's see, uh, I'll throw out a few more questions for you. We've had a lot of them come in, which is really great. Uh, let's see. Um, a, a question from Jalili Adebiyi. Could you please um, perhaps mention some demographics that might have felt that the program was not beneficial to them and their underlying reasons? Uh, is that applied to me, Julia? Julia? Um, yes. Okay, yes. So, um, great question. You know, there's this, you've seen this pattern of 15 or 20 percent of the farmers not finding the system useful. So we looked a little bit deeper into that, and they're a little bit more affluent, well-to-do farmers, better educated, and they actually did not feel like there was a lot of value in, you know, this system, and they're doing pretty well and they wanted something more. And what we figured out is that if we were to address those 15, 20% of the farmers, um, we r run the risk of making the system too complex and alienate the other 85 or 80% who found the system very useful in the first place for its simplicity. So I think there's a sweet spot. You know, aiming for 100% is not possible, and you have to leave it at some point. And if your goal is to aim for scale, economy of scale, 80% um, is a good number. So what we know is that a lot of these farmers are um, the ones that did not find it very useful are much well-to-do and, uh, you know, they have um, pretty good farming income and much better educated that they were not that motivated enough to use such a system. Uh, thank you. Let's see. I think I'll throw out a couple more questions to you, Faisal. Um, as long as we have you on the line, since I know that you need to uh, drop off a bit before the webinar ends. Um, one question that is, is certainly a classic that I think people always wonder is from Don Mulder. How do you make this project sustainable? What is your exit strategy? So we actually, all these systems, we're not running them anymore. Uh, we're in the business of getting out of business, and that's what I always like to say. And I couldn't show it in my presentation. But in each of these countries, there are actually stakeholders who are currently running and owning the system, managing it from their own infrastructure, manpower. In the case of Pakistan, you know, the federal government opened a permanent budget line uh, to, uh, to hire someone and run this system and also the other hardware infrastructure. All we did is we co-developed the system and get, provided them the training. In India's case, um, some private sector and institution were already involved, and they're running it right now. In Bangladesh's case, it's also the same story. So we are already sort of in the exit mode. We have basically provided the idea, the recipe, and shared our knowledge. So that was the goal, is to be in the business of getting out of business from the get-go. Great. 
Great. And let's see, one last question for the moment. I'll reserve the um, presenter's right to ask a question of the, another presenter. Uh, so Sarah Share wanted to ask you, are there ways that the other water user groups, such as agro-processing companies, municipal water utilities, and environmentalists, could help farmers scale up these irrigation innovations? So th I think that's a great question. We've never thought about it like that because most of the application in South Asia has been in rural regions, but certainly it could be tried out. I mean, right now I wouldn't know uh, how to go about that, but uh, you know, if there are local utilities and uh, other sectors want to play a role, it could be done. I do know in the case of Bangladesh, we are reaching out to the Agricultural Extension Office which is an arm of the agriculture ministry, and they'll play a role. But you know, um, other sectors like, say, um, the road transportation or the cities, we haven't really figured that out yet. Uh, wonderful, thank you. Um, and thanks to again to our participants for posting so many excellent questions in the chat box. I think uh, we might circle back to you again, uh, Faisal, before you need to go, but I thought we um, could also come back to Sarah and Pete. Let's see. Um, so we had a few questions come in earlier. Um, I'll go down or go back to a couple that came in for Sarah. Uh, so Diane Russell mentioned that it's really important to discuss asymmetrical power relations and landscape management approaches and how to work in situations of low trust in government and weak civil society. And uh, Muni Abarakat had a question related to that, wanting to know if the limitations of integrated natural resource management approaches are higher at the governance level versus the farmer and individual level. Uh, sure, those are two really easy questions to answer. Um, I think the, I, I don't at all underestimate the challenges of doing integrated landscape management that require these kinds of long-term relationship building negotiations and, 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 and a plan, planning around trade-offs and synergies between different stakeholders. It's only that you can't actually achieve objectives without doing those things. So I think it's really about uh, addressing the power relations. And I, and I think there's two dimensions of the power relations question. Uh, one of them is within landscapes between people with low power and, and, and larger power, and are the and, and that when you're defining the long-term vision and priorities for action within the landscape, are the concerns of some of the lower, less powerful groups taken into account? And I think, in fact, um, a, a well a well facilitated landscape partnership makes those things much more visible. It's not going to fully overcome the power differences, but it's going to make it very transparent and create opportunities for discussing alternative ways of, addr of, of addressing, of, of, of implementing production, consumption markets, et cetera, that will address their issues. So I think, um, I think there's a lot of facilitation tools that have been developed to help those conversations work more effectively, to organize stakeholder groups whereby, for example, groups that maybe are less powerful, less literate, work in different languages, actually have pre-meetings before the main meetings of the partnership so that they're well prepared and can articulate what they need. Making things very transparent by using a lot of visuals and maps. Uh, not depending on written reports, but uh, rather on other means of communication that will involve a, a lot of other people. There's some really interesting innovations around the use of WhatsApp and other things to bring in other voices and some really excellent work that's been done on trying to improve uh, women's voices within these landscape partnerships. But I also wanted to mention there's another dimension of this that um, when I started working and, and observing and, and learning from landscape partnerships back in, in two, from, since 2002, almost all the early ones were very locally driven. Um, they were, they were uh, 15 communities around uh, a, a water resource that was, that had, had, had was no longer, uh, the, the water was no longer flowing year round, and they realized they all needed to do um, uh, watershed restoration in order to try to get that water uh, running together, and they needed to modify their agricultural practices practices, et cetera. Um, what's happening now is that the power of these collaboratives to address 
these issues in an integrated way for the SDGs, for the climate agreements, has actually piqued the, the interest of national governments and, 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 and international organizations. And there's now a, a, a lot of money flowing into landscape partnerships where the shots are being called by those really by those higher level actors not who are not really embracing the idea of locally led landscape strategies. And I think that's the other aspect of um, dynamics that that uh, bilateral organizations like USAID, international uh, NGOs, like WWF and others need to also be, be looking at not only how they're handling it within the landscape, but also um, between the two. Um, the, the trust issue, in places where there's no trust in anybody, it's pretty hard to do these kinds of landscape partnerships. And the issue is to really find those institutions that are institutions of trust that can be the initial conveners, such as sometimes it's faith-based organizations, uh, sometimes it's local universities and others that are respected, and allow them to be the conveners and facilitators and spend that early time around conversation and shared understanding, because if you don't have it, you can't really move forward beyond that. If the trust isn't there, you can't do these things. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Faisal, I know if you're still on, um, I know you have to drop off soon, so perhaps we'll just throw out one last question for you. Um, and then we can always follow up and, and um, make sure that you've at least seen all of the questions that have come in. Let's see. Yeah. Um, well, I, I did think um, Christopher Bowden's clarifying question was a good one. Where did Pani get their yield data from to compare with the government's previous values? So when we piloted Pani in India, it was in northern India, so we were already serving the farmers after the end of the growing season of winter wheat of how much they got, um, you know, the yield for wheat. So that's where we got the data from for that Pani site. Now, we were not monitoring the yield data before that, and we really didn't have the money to do a randomized control trial. So then for the government yield data, um, I think it's not that hard to find if you Google. There's a government ag website ministry where they report the yield for wheat um, in uh, as a function of different provinces and uh, regions, and you get it down to, I think, even uh, irrigation districts. Uh, I will mention that, uh, just to keep in mind, uh, wheat yield in general in India has been going up the last 15, 20 years because of better seeds and fertilizers. So it is on the upswing, uh, but by virtue of, I think, uh, minimizing irrigation waste, it's probably improved a little bit more. So we got it from the government the website data, the government reported that yield data. And the, for our site, we monitored them. Um, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for posting those links um, and resources in the chat box. I think those will be really helpful to our audience. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll officially uh, say farewell to you, Faisal. Thank you so much for joining and for your really excellent presentation and answering of the questions. Thank you so much, everyone, Emily, um, Julie, and, uh, of course, Adam and the audience and our esteemed speakers. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, we do have uh, up to 15 minutes left to continue answering some questions. And uh, so I'll come back to a few questions for Pete. Uh, let's see. So um, first up, Pete, uh, Rabia Tanweer asked if you have seen silos of knowledge and work that you've identified in reducing food loss and waste in farms particularly in developing countries. And I'm assuming that um, they are asking, just if you're seeing places where communication is not happening properly or, or um, different segments are, are not speaking to each other but should. I mean, yes. We, World Wildlife Fund, have conducted some of our own post-harvest loss surveys and, and research on farms. Namely, I know our South Africa office has has done quite a bit. Um, I've seen research out of our Zambia office. And, and I think overall in Africa, post-harvest loss has been a big topic and a big focus of research. Um, where I think we could do better is taking it out of the silos that exist and really start looking at this from a system level. Start including buyers and sellers together and start looking at a better food system design with the intention of having food loss and waste built into that design. And then also having 
biodiversity, um, as much habitat conversion um, as possible not done. Uh, so I think that's how we get out of the silos is we start to expand this to a larger system level conversation, uh, really in line with what Sarah is saying on collaborative engagement for development. Uh, thank you, Pete. Let's see. Um, another uh, more general question. There were a few questions and comments about hospitality and food waste. And so we thought perhaps we should address that a little bit more, um, how the hospitality sector can influence uh, food waste and, and what their role should be. Sure. I just think it's a fascinating intersection. I mean, you have tourism in a place like uh, Victoria Falls just booming, right? They're, they're building and they have a new airport. There's just a huge volume of people that are now flooding to areas like this. And for the most part, they're there to see the biodiversity uh, and to see the wildlife and the landscapes. But what the connection that is not made is that the reason why we're losing that is because of, maybe it's because of the buffet they're sitting down to eat at the hotel, right? And so I think we need to I think hospitality is a great intersection for us to not only do this work within the supply chain, the buyer-seller connection, post-harvest loss, but it's a unique opportunity to get consumers aware of what's going on with the food system and the true impacts that food has on habitat, on biodiversity, on water, on farming. And so that's why it's really unique to me. I think it represents this unique intersection where we can try to do as much as possible and build that consumer awareness as well. Uh, thank you, Pete. Um, let's see. I think that uh, as we're continuing with our questions, we're also going to bring up some polls for our participants, since we know that some people may need to drop off a bit early. Uh, so we'll bring up um, some polls for you to answer as you are heading out. Uh, to let us know a bit more about how we can continue to improve these webinars going forward um, and whether this contributed to your learning. So please take a moment to fill those out. Let's see. Um, all right, another question for Pete from Mariwo Spekele. How are we talking about food loss and waste management in areas that don't have access to infrastructures like roads, enough energy, market access, uh, how does that kind of change the conversation? Yeah, it's, it's definitely important, not only transportation, but refrigeration. Um, what it requires is that you have to start looking at investments into those technologies, into that infrastructure, and that's two parts. It's working with the private sector, so working with buyers like hotels, retailers, restaurants, to make some effort to invest in that, but then it's also going to take some really uh, serious work with governments to see that they're also making that investment into infrastructure. And what I will say is there, there is growing momentum to uh, you know, build loans and to have major, major institutions start to provide loans for this type of work, this infrastructure development. Um, but it's it's not going to be it's going to be both private sector and governments that have to step up and to make those investments. Let's see. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Pete. As long as we are uh, ha have you at the yeah. mic, um, I'll ask one more question for you from Jonathan Casey. Has a World Wildlife Foundation also looked at losses linked to pests and diseases and the impacts on biodiversity from the use of pesticides and fungicides? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the studies that we did, I believe in Zambia, did look at pest mitigation, um, especially on the storage side, when, you, when we're storing crops and subsistence farmers storing things in local villages or communities. So we have looked at that. Um, overall, one of our biggest calls to action is just to reduce the amount of inputs into the farming system, right? Reducing the amount of pesticides uh, and herbicides that we're using. 
one, there, there's potentially a great ROI for farmers, right? When you're reducing your input costs, you're potentially increasing your margins and your profitability. Um, but then we're also, you know, advocating for biodiversity, right? We, we, we need to come from a place of regenerative agriculture where we're trying to build up systems and more natural systems and not always approach it by saying, let's go out and in the process kill bad bugs, but then kill the good ones in the process. So I think these start to all interlink together. And uh, the nice thing about food loss and waste is it gets us out on the farms, right? It gets us in the systems and measuring and trying to figure out how we address these problems through measurement and scientific data. Thank you, Pete. I will come back to Sarah for a moment. Um, and Sarah, I know that we wanted to have you talk a bit more about the roles of private companies um, and about how finance can be mobilized for both the enabling and the asset investments that you spoke of. Okay. Uh, sure, thanks very much. Um, I did want to say that if, if you all will remember seeing that that uh, map that showed the 400 and something, 38 or whatever, uh, landscape partnerships that we had documented for a while, one of the things that was notable when we were doing those reviews is that only about 25% of those landscape initiatives had private companies as partners. And this was really surprising because they were all agricultural, and, and agriculture is basically a private sector activity. For them. Um, and so we, we tried to look into that a little bit more deeply and identified a number of barriers on both sides that were preventing private companies from becoming partners of these landscape uh, partnerships. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last five years has been a quite notable growth of interest in private companies um, for a number of reasons of, of being coming actually partners and be perceived by partners as doing that in, in, in a responsible way. Uh, some of them are the, are the companies that have made things like deforestation-free commitments or are really seeing that their own um, business model is dependent upon adequate water resources, which are disappearing, um, the groups that have made commitments around climate that can't really meet their commitments without having other actors in the landscape also do complementary things or co-invest in some activities. So we are starting to see uh, much more interest in private sector in becoming partners. They're still struggling with what roles they should be playing. Um, and I'm not talking here about the, the ones that really just have no interest. Uh, they're companies that really don't have a business um, uh, re rationale for being partners, and some of them have a business rationale in, in actually in working in, 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 in uh, opposition to these landscape partnerships, which is a sort of another category of actors um, for which one really needs other than external, if they're powerful, other external allies of the landscape partnerships to deal with those. But I think there is a lot more promising opportunities for, for, for partnering with private companies that, that where there really is a business um, rationale for them to be part of that. And understanding that business rationale is really key. The other thing that we've learned over the last decade is a major constraint to success in these landscape partnerships is that even when they do a fantastic job of the planning and the design and they find integrated solutions and they're getting their policies in line, they can't get financing for the type of integrated investments that are required and they can't get them for scaling their pilot work. Um, and so there's been some really interesting, uh, innovative work on finance um, on two dimensions. One is how these landscape partnerships can internally organize themselves much more systematically to translate their action plan into an investment plan for private funding, civic funding, um, uh, public funding, uh, and, and blended funding. Uh, and so just reducing the cost and, and ensuring that the kinds of investments that are made across the landscape are more coordinated. Um, the other one is some new, very new models of finance, which enable much larger amounts of, 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 of funding to shift to sustainable investments in landscapes that in which the, the, one of the criteria for um, making the funding available is that it is consistent with a landscape uh, vision and, and agreed objectives, et cetera. So I think um, we should all be watching for some of the new innovations in, in finance that I think will make these landscape partnerships much more, um, uh, much, much more stable and more and able to achieve their goals much more quickly. And just one last 
piece about that. Most of the funding needs to go to the actual things that are happening on the ground. It's funding for farmers and for co-ops and for infrastructure and for market supply chains and for um, you know, government programs. Um, but there's a really critical part of funding, which is long-term funding to sustain these landscape partnerships and the institutional relationships uh, and keeping them together, which right now is grossly underfunded. And I think looking for solution, funding solutions for those is a, is a high priority. Thank you so much, Sarah. We're coming up close to the end of our time, so I would like to just pose uh, one final question to both uh, Sarah and Pete, um, which is, what recommendations would the speakers have uh, for improved programming for food security, but particularly um, looking at USAID and other large donors? We'd, we'd just love uh, one or two of your broader recommendations. Pete, do you want to go first? I, would, I mean, I would say uh, doing these collaborative engagements for development, like Sarah has described, are absolutely essential. Um, and I, and for me, it's it's making sure that food loss and waste is built into these assessments right up front, with a key eye for making sure that we're designing it out of the system and making the proper investments in order to do that. Um, we we've got a a start of a project like this that's happening in Victoria Falls region, that center, that heart of the Kaza region, which I ex explained. And I'm hopeful that that could be a really great model for how we can build food loss and waste into these type of projects where we have, you know, exploding population, tourism, all the works, and we can still have, you know, a future that's great for people and for the planet. So I'm hoping to be able to share that uh, as soon as we can to show it as a model. Um, over to me then, uh, this is Sarah. Um, actually, the USAID has done some really fantastic, is doing fantastic, some fantastic work on the food security side of things and, um, and nutritional security, and also has a lot of programming around landscape the initiatives, whether it's around watershed and free points or biodiversity or land degradation, I would really love to see USID more systematically link to these programs to build food security objectives into the landscape programming and vice versa. Um, so that to me, that's the most critical thing is to really build that build that bridge. Um, the, the, the second thing is I was mentioning this new initiative on a thousand landscapes for a billion people, which is focused on system-wide changes that will make it easier for these landscape partnerships to work effectively together. And I would love to, to explore with the USAID possibilities to become a partner in that activity. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for those recommendations. Uh, we are just about at the hour, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up this webinar. I would like to uh, extend a sincere thank you to the AgriLinks team for uh, managing and producing uh, this event today. Uh, thank you to Emily Weeks for your introduction and to our three speakers for your really excellent presentations and uh, for deftly answering the questions that have come in. And most importantly, thank you to our attendees. Uh, you are the reason that we hold these events, to uh, share knowledge with all of you and to help make connections um, and engage around these important food security topics. So we hope to see you at future AgroLinks events. Keep your eye on your emails for announcements. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.